Mom, what if there's something I really, really like to get? Well, honey, I think you know what you need to do. Are you sure you want to? Mm hmm. Good morning. It is good to be here with you today. Last week, Caroline and I had the opportunity to get away, and now it's good to be back. This is the time in our service when our church meeting in two locations becomes one as we study God's Word together. Each week we do that, and this week we finish up a series on the whole issue of finances. And you and I both know that the moment the preacher starts talking about finances is the moment it feels like he switched to meddling, because it's, it's just one of those subjects that feels personal, we question motivation, like why are we talking about money? And yet every week as we have looked into God's word, we discover again, this, this is an important subject. Let me, let me show you one of those verses. You've heard this one before, at least in some form or another, out of 1 Timothy chapter 6, where it says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Now let me warn you, you've heard that one incorrectly. You've heard someone say, money is the root of all evil. Now, that's wrong for a couple reasons. Number one, you can't trace every sin back to money. Number two, it's wrong because the Bible does not say money is the root of all evil, but the love of money is a root of all kinds of nasty stuff. Paul goes on to explain why in the second part of the verse. It is through this craving, so the love of money, that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Have you ever heard the phrase, man, he sold his soul to the devil? Actually, the Bible says that's true. Jesus predicted it in the parable of the sowers where he says, hey, you know that weedy soil, like it looks good? But in time, the cares of the world, the, the riches and wealth choke it out so there is no fruit. Satan himself tempted Jesus in the same way, that he would bow to Satan to get the kingdoms of the world. Satan will lure you in with that very temptation. And some have said, I'm done with Jesus. Because more than I want Jesus, I want this stuff. Not only have some walked away from the faith, many have caused great pain in their lives because of money. And I'm telling you what, there are many of us in the room who have seen that. You have somebody that works with you or maybe even works for you. 
and you have witnessed the destruction in their lives that was caused by the love of money. And so, you know, it might make us a little bit nervous. We might wonder, okay, why are we talking about money? Is it just that the church wants more of mine? I mean, what's really going on? Are we short on cash? I mean, we, we may wonder, we may feel a little uncomfortable, we may feel like it's a personal issue, but we know this. We, we got to talk about it. Like, this is something that's important to us and our experience of life. So for the last three weeks, we've been making one discovery after the other. Number one, money is a spiritual issue. Jesus said straight up, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Like you've been wondering what was going on. Money is a spiritual issue. One of the things we do in America is we try to compartmentalize our lives. Like I have my church life and friends and I have my work life and I guess I have a couple friends at work, you know, you know, and then I have, you know, the kids and the hobby and that kind of stuff going on. And then over here, I've kind of got my finances and Jesus makes it really clear. You do not have compartments in your life. You are life. And, and you know, as supervisors, how the issues of marriage and brokenness at home can cause your worker to be less productive at work. People would say, hey, what I do at home or what I do off the clock is my business. And you're like, no, 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 no. I've seen it in my employees. I've seen it in my team. Those different areas of your life affect your life. It's the same way with money. You've been tempted to say, I've got my spiritual life and I've got my financial life. And Jesus would say, "Uh uh-uh. Your finances impact your relationship with me. Week two, money... Here's where it actually gets exciting. Money can impact eternity. Now, if we just buy stuff for here, uh, we're in trouble of losing it quick. Like the moment you drive it off the lot, the moment you put it on, the moment you buy that model, the next one comes out. I mean, the moment you buy it, it's depreciating. And the moment you buy it, you got to protect it because somebody could take it and steal it. And you cannot take it with you. So anything we invest here for here is immediately decaying. It's immediately depreciating. We're immediately losing it, to be truthful. But Jesus said there is a way in which you can take your money and invest it in such a way that it will last forever. And he said, hey, there's this guy who understood what most of my kids don't understand. That you can use money to buy friends. And he said, hey, my my kids need to understand this because you can use your money in such a way that it will impact people's lives. And they'll say, why did you help me? Like, why did you care about me? Why did you give me that? And you'll be able to share the gospel with them and say, hey, it's not because I'm awesome. It's because Jesus is awesome. Let me tell you about him. And there will, in fact, be people in heaven that when you get there, if you've invested your money like this, they will say to you, I'm here because you told me about Jesus. And I accepted him as my savior and I have eternal life because of the way you spent your money. And the truth of the matter is, it's not just about the money you give away. You can actually spend your money strategically. I honestly believe that the vacation Carol Ann and I just went on, the thousand bucks and a little more that we spent to go to Arizona for a week and stay with friends and all that, I honestly believe it was an eternal investment. It was an investment in the relationship with my wife. It was an investment in the relationship with my children. It was an investment in discerning what are we doing in life. Because when we were in Arizona, we had some difficult conversations. There was this thing that's been rubbing in our marriage. And on one of our walks in the desert, I said, all right, let's talk about it. Like, I didn't want to talk about it. I just wanted to act like everything was okay. But we used that time to talk. There was also some parenting issues that we had going on. And so Carol Ann was reading a book, and we were discussing it. It was like, hey, can we really have a new child by Friday? Can we really do this thing differently? And we were talking about our lives. Where is God leading us? Like, what is it we want to accomplish by 50 that would glorify God? Because we're getting really close to 50. And what do we, what do we want to do by the end of life? And how can we really honor God with our lives? It was an eternal investment. It was not just an escape. It was not just a getaway. It was not just a feel good about ourselves trip. Like it was something that we used together to refresh our relationship and really engage in some important conversation. When Jesus said invest your money eternally, he wasn't just saying give it all away, give it all away, give it all away. You can spend your money strategically. And then last week, man, Kevin did a great job. It's so fun to come back and and hear you guys talking about how God used Kevin to speak to us. I just love when he comes over from August Gate and preaches the word. 
And you heard the message from Jesus clearly. Jesus said, all that stuff you got, it's not yours. Think like a money manager. Think like an investment broker. You are managing the wealth of another person. The stuff you have is God's. It never was yours. And that is so freeing when we are tempted to say, mine, mine, don't touch it. It never was yours. It is so freeing to realize, oh, it's my dad's. I'm taking care of my father's stuff. And then at the end of life, when I've done well, my father will say to me, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. You did good with the little bit I gave you. Now I'm going to get to give you more. It's so awesome to begin to discover the joy of money and to see how that joy impacts our spiritual lives. And we don't need to try to act like they're separate. We don't need to act like, oh, no, it's this other thing. Don't talk about it. We begin to bring those subjects together when we realize I'm discovering life even in what God has given me financially. So today we're going to add one more piece as we wrap up this study. So if you have your Bible or your Bible app, we're headed to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, pretty easy to find. Go to the New Testament. We have the four Gospels to start it off, and then the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2. And what we're going to do, just kind of give away the punchline, we're going to take a peek into the lives of people who had seen Jesus alive. So what we're going to do is take a look at the lives of people who were with Jesus before he died on the cross, and they saw him raised from the dead, and it changed their lives. So let me catch you up. In the book of Acts, Jesus says, I'm leaving. He predicted his death and how it would happen, predicted his resurrection, and pulled it off. He then spent 40 days with his core disciples teaching them, revealing to them what he had been telling them, but now it's starting to click. He ascended into heaven and told them to wait in Jerusalem that the Holy Spirit would come. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came dramatically and changed the lives of these Christ followers. He changed their lives, but life did not get easier. They were quickly arrested for preaching Jesus in the temple. Then the apostles as a, as a whole were arrested for preaching Jesus in the temple. They were beaten. Stephen would be the first Christian who was killed for his faith, making him a martyr. James would be the first apostle killed as a martyr because of his faith. If your fire is a little bit dry, if your fire is a little bit wet, I should say, not dry. If your fire is a little bit lacking... Man, read the first half of the book of Acts. Like, do the first 13 chapters, and you begin to see what God did in the lives of people who saw Jesus was alive. If you're in one of those places where you find yourself thinking, man, I don't even know if the Bible's true. I don't even know if I believe this Jesus thing. Like, if you're in a season of doubting, read the book of Acts. You know what you'll see? Jesus did not do this for some quick payoff you see some people are like nah you know did maybe jesus did this and he was just trying to get a thing for himself the thing he got for himself was dead or you might say well okay 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 it wasn't jesus but but you know like those early disciples they kind of kind of ramped up the story a little bit so they could make some money off this gig or have have fame and fortune now start reading they're beaten tortured killed they gave their lives to tell the story of jesus being alive they did it for no ulterior motive or personal gain and you realize wow these people really did believe the message they were preaching they did because they saw jesus alive after they knew him to be dead they had experienced the indwelling of the holy spirit on the day of pentecost and he had changed their lives So let's jump into the story. Verse 42 of Acts chapter 2, and we're looking at the lives of people who saw Jesus alive. And they, those Christians, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayers, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. 
Now here's the temptation. We've got to stop. Many times, Christians today read a passage like this, read Acts, and they're like, man, I want it to be today like it was back then. I want to be a first century Christian. I want us to be a first century church. And so they begin looking in verses like this and think, okay, all right, we got to get together and we got to do the apostles' teaching thing and fellowship and breaking of bread. I wonder how they broke the bread. They break it in half or in thirds or little chunks or big chunks. How did they do that exactly? And this, these prayers, like where do we get them? I can't, is, there, is there a copy of the, the early prayers in the church that we need to pray? I mean, because we need to do exactly what they did back then. And then verse 43, you know, there are many wonders and signs. There are people to get, get together as a church and they don't think they've done church until there's a wonder or a sign. Because the temptation is to try to replicate everything that happened. That's not the intent of the book of Acts. It is a description of the lives of those who saw Jesus alive. We're not trying to mimic them. We're not trying to replicate that. We're not trying to go back to the first century. It's 2018. We're not going to the Middle East. It's the United States. What we're asking ourselves the question is, what do we see about the lives who saw Jesus alive. Verse 42 and 43, I think we can sum it up with two words. Devoted and in awe. Devoted and awe. These people had seen a magnificent move of God. They had seen a resurrected Jesus. They had experienced indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And they were in awe. We're we're not trying to replicate it. But we are invited to be in awe at what God is doing. But if we're not careful, we'll walk right by it and not even see it. Every Monday when our guys get together to study the passage that I'll be preaching the next weekend, my first question is this. Where have you seen God moving? What lives have you been witnessing that have been transformed because if we're not looking we'll walk by and not see it the second thing we see in this passage is that they were devoted having seen Jesus alive they had reoriented their lives before Jesus was resurrected before the Holy Spirit came you know what the disciples were trying to do to Jesus they were trying to get Jesus to be the person they wanted him to be they were trying to get Jesus to benefit them After Jesus was resurrected and the power of the Holy Spirit rested among them, they were solely devoted to the gospel. They were solely devoted to living out this salvation God had given them and sharing this salvation with everyone around them. That's what we see in the lives of those who saw Jesus alive. Now let's keep going. Verse 44. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings, distributing proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. So again, we're we're tempted to try to replicate this. We're tempted to to read through here and go, okay, uh, they were together. Holy smokes, Day by day, like they were hanging out every day, like to be right with God, you got to go to church every day. I thought once a week was pretty tough, but you know, every day, and, and hey, we don't know, we don't know where they, did they get together, like in groups as they went to work, uh, was it during the prayer hour in the temple that they gathered, was it after the sun went down and everybody's like, I don't have any electricity, you have any electricity, I got nothing to do, why don't you come over, I, we don't know when they did it. But a regular daily practice was that they were spending time together. And then that other part, this one just gets really weird. Selling their possessions and belonging and distributing the proceeds to all. I mean, some of us are reading this and going, were they in a commune? Is this a cult or is this followers of Jesus? I mean, what's really going on here? The Bible does not say that everyone liquidated all of their assets and they put a big pile of money in the middle and bought a house together. Or they didn't start no frat house or something like that. You know, that's not what the Bible says. 
The Bible says that regularly you saw people selling their stuff when somebody else needed stuff. So what's going on? One, we see a people who are grateful. And two, we see a people who are together. They were grateful. There it says, praising God. I mean, they were thanking God for what he has done. Having seen Jesus alive, understanding that salvation was brought to humanity, they were grateful. Let me tell you this. It gets a whole lot easier to be generous when you go old school and count your blessings. It is really easy to share what you have with others when you are overwhelmed with the generosity of God for you. You know when it's hard to be really generous? Is when you're grasping and coveting and longing for more for you. It's impossible to be generous. You want to make it easy to be generous? Count your blessings. The second thing we see in those three verses is that they were together. Together. If your child or if your best friend was about to die, starve to death, freeze to death, would you sell your car? Would you sell your house if your child's life was at stake and he or she really needed it? Yeah. I mean, it's my kid. It's my best friend. Of course I would sell my car. Of course, shucks, I'd sell my house. I, I mean, of course. It's not usually that dramatic. I mean, when, when we were in Arizona, we, we stayed with friends. And Denny says that every year when we get there, every year when we walk in the front door, he says, guys, our house is your house. Treat it that way. They let us use their water. They let us burn their electricity. They don't know it, but we ate their food. You know, They didn't care. They, they did not care. Their house is our house. And when we have friendships, when we have genuine community, it really is like, hey, get in the refrigerator. It doesn't matter. You're, you're one of mine. Just take care of it. One of the powerful ways to discover opportunities to be generous is to be in relationship with other people. I mean, get in a group. Spend some time with other people. Needs will come up and you'll be able to meet them. Needs will come up and sometimes they'll be yours. And others in the group will take care of your needs. It's part of community. The text simply said that then when there was a genuine need among them, the need was met by others' resources. They were a grateful people who were together. And it changed the way they lived. And it changed the impact of their lives. Look, last one at verse 47. Praising God. So they're still glorifying God, worshiping God, thanking God. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now this is ironic, and we don't even realize how ironic it was. It was ironic that the people had favor, these Christians had favor with the people around them, because there were some really strange rumors being spread about Christians back then. The strangest one was that we are cannibals. Like what? Why were they saying Christians were cannibals? Because we ate his body and drank his blood. Communion was misunderstood in the region. And so people are like, man, those are weirdos. I mean, they've got some dude and they're still cutting up his body and drinking his blood. I don't know how that works. They are strange. But Christians had favor in Jerusalem and in their communities because people saw something different. There were literally people in the region saying, I don't know if I believe what they believe. But man, those people are legit. And it wasn't just like this little burst of love. It wasn't just this short love fest that happened among Christians. Three centuries later, 
the Roman emperor wrote, so you can look it up in Roman history, there is not a needy person among them, and they even help our needy. People who would say, I don't believe what they believe about that Jesus being alive. But I'll tell you this, they're legit. And because of that, because the favor of people, they had favor with the people around them, people kept asking, hey, no, what's this thing you do in your church? Like eat a guy and drink his blood? Like what, what's really going on? And people were sharing what Jesus had done, what Jesus had accomplished, and more and more people are getting saved. To the place where it says God added to their number on a daily basis. People who were coming to experience life through Jesus Christ. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what it would look like in your life if God began or continued to use you like that? Giving you favor with other people that are regularly asking, like, what's the deal with you? Opening doors for you to share the hope that you had in Jesus. What would it look like if we as a church began to experience the favor of God upon our neighbors to where they're asking us, now what's the deal with your church? You know, I, I know, and you know, Marion and Carbondale and got a Walmart, like what, but what's the real deal? The impact would be staggering. And the good news is. We're not talking about it beginning, but we are talking about it continuing. Let me, let me share a few celebrations. We'll actually throw them up on the screen. As I stand in front of you today, I, I'm being honest when I say every year, every year that passes, I am more impressed with the church I came to than what I first appreciated. Like each year, I more appreciate the church we were before I ever got here. Sometimes I have to pinch myself because it has been such a blessing to be the pastor of this church. We got to come in 2007 and build on that foundation. One of the areas we were struggling with is we'd had a couple bad years financially. And our missions giving, so when we say missions, we're talking about everything outside of Cornerstone, everything we give away and partner with other ministries, or it's not about us doing our ministry, had dropped down to about 3%. And by 2008, we got that up to 10%, and it's stayed there ever since. And, and some years, that's been kind of hard, because we're a, a relatively young church, I'm still working on some strategies about how to get the three-year-olds better on their giving. So if you have any strategies, I, I'd love to hear. And, and we're young. Many of us are new to this journey of following Jesus. And, you know, finances is one of those things that comes along uh, as we work out of the messes that we've gotten ourselves into. But every year we've said, hey, we're not dropping below 10%. It's been as high as 14% of missions giving like that, but never below 10 Then... In 2013, we saw the beginning of a fulfillment of a vision to really bless Southern Illinois. We had a dream of having a secondhand store where all the proceeds of that store would be invested right back into Southern Illinois. Nothing going to Cornerstone. It was not one of those kind of deals. It was to go into Southern Illinois to invest in the kingdom and what God is doing outside of our church. And thankfully... Holly Dodd felt called to start that ministry, and we have had an amazing Renew staff that has served in the warehouse and sweated when it's hot and froze when it's cold, serving God and providing a way for us to bless Southern Illinois. And you know how it is with a new business. It takes a few years to kind of get your feet under you, and we're there. Like the future is really bright for how those funds will be used to bless our neighbors. And then in 2015, if you were around back then, you know that God was blessing and our church was being generous and we said, you know what, let's, let's pull off some funds on top of the 10% and let's start giving some money away. 
And that year we built a house. And the Habitat people told us it was the first house in southern Illinois that was totally funded and staffed by one organization. Never had it been done before. We paid for that house. Yeah, you guys, we together got to do something really special. And so we did that. We built the house, gave it away, gave a bunch of resources to schools that year. Over about a one-year period, we gave away over $100,000 on top of what our, our regular missions giving was. And we got a taste of what could be. And then last year, we had our first serve so ill, going out to southern Illinois, which has been the mission of this church from the beginning, five counties, 29 sites, 360 people out serving. And we're already putting the details in place. Serve so ill 2018 will be even better by God's grace and as we team up to bless our neighbors. And then there's this thing. It was a vision God gave me years ago, and I thought, and I kind of lost, not lost it, but doubted it. And God has renewed that in me with quite a bit of confidence of saying, there is a day coming, not sure what year, but there is a day coming when we will be a 50-50 church, where half of what comes in goes right back out to bless our neighbors in southern Illinois and to the uttermost parts of the earth. I was sharing this with our pastors again. I said, guys, I I really feel that God has given me faith to believe we can get there. And I'm thinking 50-50 by 2050. Like I'm thinking if each year you raise a percent and and this year we raise it 2% and did it, you know, kind of work that way, I think we can get to 50%. And Pastor Jason's like, that's not soon enough. We can do it a whole lot faster than that. I'm like, dude, you got more faith than I do. Because I know to get there, we have to be really strategic in the way we spend our money in doing ministry here. And I know that there is no spending plan that gets us to 50-50 alone. Because it will take generosity from us as a group. I mean, we got to team up big time to be able to pull that off. But we can do it. We can do it. I actually think God is calling us to do it. Can you imagine the favor of God upon our neighbors when we become that generous? But it won't just happen. It won't be just one year we just wake up and go, oh, we arrived. Isn't that cool? Like it will take real discipline, real work for us to get there as, as a church which reminds me of one of my, uh, my favorite sayings about generosity. Generosity is fueled by discipline and full of emotion. Fueled by discipline, full of emotion. Let's talk about the emotion part first. You know that's true. All of us have bought a Christmas present. All of us have bought a, a birthday gift. All of us have bought something for someone and we could not wait for them to open it. Like if we were opening presents on the same day, like we didn't even care about that. We could not wait for them to open the present. It was the greatest joy. It's no wonder Jesus said it is more blessed to give than receive. And we know the joy that will come with having stewarded our resources well and stand in front of our Father and our Heavenly Father say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Generosity is full of emotion. We love to be generous. But the emotion doesn't fuel it. Discipline does. If we just continue to do what we've always done, we'll always get what we've always gotten. You see, we trick ourselves by saying, man, when I win the lottery, I'm going to be generous. When my rich uncle dies and my boat comes in, I'm going to be generous. No, you won't. No, you won't. You, you, You know what the secret factor is, according to Americans? 2x. 2x. What do do I mean by that? When we're polled as Americans, we always believe that if we had twice as much, all of our problems would be solved. Here's where it gets ironic. It holds the same no matter how much money you make. Literally, here are the numbers. For those who make $25,000 a year, they believe the magic number is 50. For those who make 50, the magic number is now 100. 
For those who make 100, it's now 200. How's that happen? We always think if we just had twice as much, all our problems would be solved. The problem is, when you get twice as much over time, there's been inflation and they take more because of taxes, and then you just want more. The fuel of generosity is discipline. Until we decide, hey, this is what I'm going to live on. This is my standard of living. We'll just keep eating it away. No matter how much of a raise or a decline or another raise, we'll just eat it all ourselves. Whenever you talk about um, money, whenever you talk about giving, I'm always asked, all right, all right, how much? And where? How much do I have to give and where do I need to give it? And like the, the second week we talked about, that's, that's really the wrong question because it's not how much do I have to give away. The question is how much do I keep for myself? Because you and I know that's going to be really embarrassing that if when we stand before Jesus, those of us who have declared Jesus as Lord, when we stand in front of him and Jesus says, hey, um, how much did you give to the kingdom advancement? Like, like, I get it, you love me, and you said that for people to be saved, they have to trust me as Savior, and you're absolutely right, I'm proof. And, um, like, how much did you give toward, like, what part of what I gave you did you give toward the advancement of the gospel to the world so people could be in heaven? It's going to be really embarrassing if we from, like, the richest country in the world are like, well, I kind of spin it on me. And then there's this dude over here in line. I mean, Jesus says what we try to keep quiet on that day is brought out and made public. Then there's this dude over here who has like six kids. And he lives in one of those countries where he made 10 bucks a day, which is six grand a year, six days a week. And we're looking at him who found a way to give. And we're like, dang. And so, so we know. And so when people ask me the number... I say to him, hey, um, the only number you find in the New Testament is 100%. Like it's just all his. So if there's a need, people sold, people gave, people left it all. I mean, 100% is all you get. 100%. If you're looking for a number other than 100%, if you go to the Old Testament, uh, the smallest number you'll find is 10%. Now, the moment I say 10%, we've got Two real big issues with that number. Number one, 10% was a law, but it's not a law for us. We are not under the law. Jesus met the requirements of the law for us. He died in our place. So we're not, we're not hitting a number to be legally qualified. We're not going to stand before God and be condemned because we did not give 10%. Jesus took our condemnation. For those of us who have accepted God's gift through Jesus for our salvation. He has already taken our condemnation. He's already granted our righteousness. When we stand in front of God, it's a question of stewardship. What did we do with what God has given us? It's going to be super embarrassing if we say zero. And I don't see how in the world we could pick a number less than 10% to shoot for, since that's the smallest number you'll find anywhere of God's people in Scripture. But it's not a law. You are free in Christ to give as he leads you to give. It's also not a license. You see, there are some of us on the journey. Like there are some of you that you're like, Ooh, I'm probably like 1%. But I've decided I'm not spending it on, all on me. And I'm, I'm moving toward generosity. If that's where you're at, you're in a, better, in a better place than some people who are given a full 10%. Why? Because there are some people who see a level, like 10%, as a license to do anything they want with the rest of it. Like, I gave God his part, and the rest of it's mine. That's not how it works. And the moment you say that is the moment you quit listening to Jesus 
and the voice of the Holy Spirit guiding the way you handle your money. So 100% is the answer. 10% is a goal. It's the smallest number we find in Scripture. To be working toward by God's grace as he leads us. Recognizing it's all his. Then where? Surprise, surprise. I actually believe that the most effective place for us to give would be our local church. That's a real surprise to you, huh? I mean, don't you want me to believe that? Don't you want me to believe that what God's called me to do is my vocation to lead this church is something I actually believe in? Don't you want me to believe that I see a pattern in Scripture of God's people generally giving to the place where they worship, and then from that place we fund crazy, awesome, gospel-spreading ministries? Don't, Don't you want me to lead like that? Don't you want me to believe that? I mean, Bill Heibel says the local church is the hope of the world. Jesus' church is manifest in local assemblies of people gathering together to worship and spread the gospel. Don't you want me to believe that? Don't you want me to practice that? I do. What if? What if, by God's grace we began to practice generosity together as God leads us in the freedom we have in Christ and partnering together to share the gospel with people who have not heard but now they're listening because we've used our money as an investment in eternity what if that happens I'll tell you this it begins with gratefulness being grateful for what God has done. Let me pray for us. God, it is with much gratefulness that we celebrate our salvation in Jesus. It is with much anticipation that we worship you today. May you receive our words of praise because you are so worthy. May you receive our gratitude as those who have been bought from the the grasp of sin and death and placed, seated at your right hand. Already our home is in another place as we await our transition from here to eternity with you. God, thank you for the life that you've given us both now and forevermore. Receive our worship, we ask in Jesus' name.